Okay. Awesome. Good. How are you? I'm good. Thanks so much for doing this. Yeah, for sure. Where uh, are you? You're on the East Coast. I'm in Florida right now. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Cool. So, so nighttime here. Had the early dinner. Um, it's the ride culture here is very early. It's like people ride at five thirty before it gets hot or traffic. So it's like I just got down here, so bedtime is like pretty early. But oh it's wow, good. okay, that's like that's like Tucson. I know people who like at least in the summer they're yeah up at like four riding early it's the only way to do it i never thought i would ride this early but one i actually lived in nashville for a little while and my friend moved there before me and he was like oh yeah we leave at 5 30 i was like what how why and then i realized just how hot it can get so you know you you adapt but and where are you right now Please. uh right now i'm in northern california okay um in my hometown so yeah we're kind of based here for the next uh six weeks or so and then we on to the next next training base where's where's that going to take you so we're gonna go well first cole um his family's from washington so we're gonna go christmas with them and then head over to uh, girona for the first uh, few months of the year okay awesome so we're this is great we're just gonna roll into this um well, let yeah, me okay cool i i always forget to ask people to do an intro and i don't want to put words in your mouth so Sevilla blunk who are you? Yeah, um, I'm Sevilla Blunk. I am 24 years old and I race a uh, cross country mountain bike for Rock Rider Ford Racing Team. Um, and yeah. Let's do the minute flashback of starting in Nika, which a lot of American cyclists, especially people on the mountain bike side, have fond memories of. When you think back to that, like what stands out and, you know, when you left there, did you, were you like, this is what I love? Like, this is who I'm going to become in my twenties or like, g give us that blurb. I'd love to hear it. Yeah. Gosh, one minute. That's not long, but okay. I'll try to make <laughs> it. It can be more than a minute. Um... It, can, it can be whatever, whatever your whatever you think about, whatever that feeling is. Yeah, for sure. No, for me, I think it really started. Um, I grew up in kind of a rural town. Um, like nature was our backyard. I grew up with two older brothers and um, growing up, like playing was just was being on our bikes or not on bikes, um, just outside, outdoors, chasing each other around, whether it's like building janky jumps and pump tracks in the backyard or um yeah, like exploring the backyard trails and fire roads and um, kind of a lot of it was on bikes. Um, and I think the competitive aspect with me and my brothers really sparked that, mm. uh, that kind of fire inside of me from a young age. Um, and then one of my older brothers started racing through NICA. And that's kind of what like, um, uh, kind of when I, when I realized that there was that you can race these bikes mm. and uh, and that there's a high school league then it was nearby and it's something that maybe I could do um it's funny because I actually was like I was really inspired by by my brother and at first it was kind of like I just want to do what he does and it what I had like kind of a love-hate relationship with a bike um sometimes you know I didn't um I, I really wanted to like to be a racer and and be like him but sometimes I didn't always enjoy like getting out on the bike and like training and climbing like I hated climbing um I loved going downhill but and then over the years that kind of grew and became something that was like um came from within me and it was just like I had this this fire and motivation for it um but yeah and then I then I started racing through Nika um in high school similar to him and just kind of took that trajectory. Um, yeah, I was kind of skipping around from little development teams in my junior years. It started kind of just as mom and pop, uh, going to like some pro XCTs. I think we went to, I, I camped at Fontana pro XCT, uh, in the back of, of my parents' minivan with my dad when I was like 16 or something. Um, and then later was on bear development team. So that kind of really gave me the support and resources that I needed to race more nationally and internationally. You were doing van life before it was even a thing. 
Yeah, I guess it was. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Do either of your brothers still ride or race? No, no. Um, they he stopped like after high school, and okay. uh, and now we're all doing super different things. Um, and I just yeah, kind of took the riding. I think, you know, and I actually, I grew up in upstate New York. I don't know if Nike is really up there. I didn't even know this sounds crazy to say that bike racing was really a thing. Like, yeah, I heard of the Tour de France. It would come on TV. But I, when I started riding, I was 26. And a kid that I played volleyball with in high school, we crossed paths. He's like, dude, I've raced bikes when we were in high school. I'm like, wait, what? And he's like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a cat one. I've been riding for years. And I was like, wait, where are you doing this? found the club, all this stuff. So I'm always, when I hear about Nike, I've coached a few people down in the Atlanta area. And it's just like, man, I hope you guys realize how awesome this is that you've found something that they're so passionate of. And the, just the group, I don't know, Nike, it just seems like it brings up so many good vibes for kids in this sport. And I just don't think like endurance sports aren't as big in the U S as they are in Europe. And so that's cool to kind of hear, um, you going through that. And what, what did you not like about training when you were, at that age, like getting into it, you're like, oh, I didn't really want to get on the bike sometimes and train. Were you doing like workouts or just riding in general? Yeah, I was just riding in general. And I think that I just, I honestly, I didn't like climbing. And uh, <laughs> I grew up like around here, you have to climb to do any kind of ride on the, on the dirt and it's steep. And um, yeah, it was just hard. Like I remember stopping, like we had this kind of uh, this one kind of mountain behind my house and uh, the climb is like 15 minutes to the top. And I remember I'd always have to stop halfway. Mm -hmm. And then I remember the time when I, I didn't have to stop. And that was like, oh, okay. Like I'm feeling better. I'm feeling a little more, like a little stronger, but yeah, I think it was that. And then also just like, um, like wanting people to ride with kind of to mm -hmm. motivate you to get out the door. Um, but yeah, I think I, I became a really like, um, intrinsically motivated person, uh, through that. And I love riding with people, but it's funny because Cole is like so motivated by riding with friends and group and training with people. And I'm like, I'm totally fine. Like training alone. Like I love like group rides and stuff, but we're really different in that way, which is funny. Yeah. I love, there's something about solo rides. i sometimes you will say I'm like antisocial. I'm like, no, I, I like you guys. I just, I just really like like solo training. If I have workout, I don't want to do it with somebody else. And it, I don't know, some people, they just don't understand that. Yeah. What's, when you were, uh, you made the comment that you would see progress, like you had to stop halfway and you got going and you like, when, when you're younger, and I've actually never really thought about this because I wasn't doing the sport then you don't have a power meter. You're probably not wearing a heart rate monitor. What was it that you were like, how did you gauge little bits of progress? Was it just the races and how you finished? Or was there something then that you got that internal feeling of like, Oh, I'm, I'm on right now. Or did that come later? Yeah, that's a really good question and hard to pinpoint that. Um, but I think there were so many times throughout like my trajectory through the sport that kind of gave me those little bits and bits of, of motivation that kind of mm -hmm. just kept me like hungry for more. Mm -hmm. And, um, Honestly, I can't remember when it was like at such a young age when I was like just starting to ride. But yeah. um, when I started racing in Nika, like it was um, it was like there were so many other girls who were in my category I was racing against and we were battling it out. And I think just like every race seeing like what I can improve uh, technically or physically or mentally um, mm -hmm. is something that was so like just motivating to be better, a little bit better every time. And those are three things that still like, that's like one of the biggest things I love about, uh, about the sport is like how there's always improvements you can make, um, mentally, physically, or technically. Let's go on the mental. What comes to mind? No pun intended. When you think about that, what's something maybe even recently in the past year, that you've been trying to go after mentally that has maybe you haven't been as strong mentally on before. Yeah. You know, I think, um, I mean, this past season has felt like, um, of it's the, the biggest season of my career in many ways. Um, but also the most intense, uh, it's the first season that I've raced pretty much a full world cup calendar and my first year on a full factory team, um, a European team. So 
a lot of big changes that that made it um made it more intense and then just racing the world cup calendar and and having some results and it just it felt really intense um and i was i i really more than ever had to like uh find ways to kind of just balance myself throughout the year i mean i'm i'm on the road like 10 or 11 months throughout the season and uh racing spending a lot of time living in europe going back and forth overseas so always battling like jet lag being in a new place a new bed and then also um having to perform at the highest level so i think i've really tried to uh hone in on like just every time i um transition into a new environment or a new place uh just trying to like balance myself and work on like just getting into that routine and that rhythm as quick as possible mm. um and it might not seem like mental but um to me it's like it's it's a it's a really a skill that I'm continuing to work on but mm. um so important to be able to like make those transitions as smooth as I can and just feel like um having my routines really helps because wherever you are you can just like pick them up again and maybe you're in France and yesterday you were in uh Colorado <laughs> but you like as as an athlete you, like I have to do that because I'm preparing to race in you know five days or whatever it is mm. um so yeah that's been like um a big challenge that I'm yeah just continuing to work on but what's so the, finding that balance is a, is a good tip for people to try and focus on when they're going abroad or something but within that you had mentioned like getting back on your routine how do you do that like the sleep that was actually one thing i was gonna ask you with the sleeping your schedule all off and you might be racing in five days do you have any tips of like how you get back in that routine like actually anything that you actually do like some people are like oh i never really eat on the plane because that makes me feel weird or like there's grounding that people go and like hang out in the grass. Like some athletes have different things they do. Is there anything that you do that you just feel like I, when I land the next 10 hours, I got to do this because it's going to help me get back on track as fast as possible. For sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, the biggest thing is like, um, well, as soon as I land, like trying to wind down from the big travel as best as you can and, get a like go to sleep um but for me what I I mean it's different every time like sometimes jet lag hits me really hard sometimes it mm. doesn't but I find that just like getting on a schedule ASAP when you arrive um is super helpful like the first couple of days it's painful uh to set your alarm at 7 30 or whatever but I just have to otherwise it seems like the jet lag adjustment takes like twice as long mm. um so yeah that's super super important for me and then also just kind of like normally I have a little bit of a morning routine you know I get up I'll do some like mobility or um yeah like have a bit of like that time in the morning and just to keep those things wherever I am and um wherever I'm traveling to is super important so it just feels like um yeah more normal and if mm. that means like traveling with your big yoga mat like that's what I do. <laughs> Are you doing yoga in the airport? Maybe if you had to. I have actually, there's a, a yoga room in, I think it's Chicago. Really? Um, yeah. In the airport. It's, uh, you know, it's kind of weird you go in, but it's like um, really quiet. And if there's nobody in there, it's a really nice place. Just if you happen to be going through Chicago, it's there. <laughs> I love that. I, there's been many times, and this is more just because I'm getting old. I'm in my 40s. So it's like, oh, man, I got, needed to go do my like fire hydrants and my cat camel and downward dog. And I'm definitely not going to do it by the gate. So yeah, if there was a yoga meditation, just a quiet space, that would be huge. You So talking internationally, you actually, I think it was on maybe your website, you had kind of in your blurb of going through where you've gone you said I was getting my butt kicked internationally in the beginning. Was that something that motivated you? Like, okay, this is a stepping stone to where I want to go in my career. Or at the same time, you're in Europe. You might be, you know, surrounded by people that speak a different language. You might be feeling like, I don't know, you're a little fish in the big ocean now. Was that intimidating? Like, how did you adapt to that? What was that feeling as you're like, okay, whew, this, these girls are strong. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I would say it was both. It was both motivating and super challenging, mentally tough at times, like Mm -hmm. um, just getting kind of beat down um, again and again and again. Uh, But also motivating to see like where that's the level and um and like okay how can I get there and and like I said like those were those were races and experiences where I saw that okay there's big uh physical improvements I need to make or there's big technical improvements the mental side is so big but it's harder to recognize I feel like especially Mm. like in the moment in the moment of having like a hard couple races or a hard you know season um but yeah I mean my first race um my first few international races were super challenging uh the courses for starters over there are just at another level and sometimes like it's normal to you know race rain or shine so if the course is completely slick and you're going off these features that are challenging in the dry but treacherous in the wet um they're still doing it so you just have to like get over that and um and race through it so that was yeah there's always like big challenges with that but I was really motivated and I think what helped is having like um not being over there for too long you know I go over and maybe I had two races that I can remember when I was in a junior junior years Um, and then you come back to the U S and you can kind of reset and like get your bearings be like, okay, like let's make the map and like, how am I going to get better? You know, whereas if you're in it for so long, it can be, yeah, it can really beat you down. What do you think you've brought up the physical and the mental again? What do you think are some of, obviously we all talk about Watts, but and I'm going to clarify for anyone that's listening. I'm a roadie. I dabble in gravel. So If I ask a question, you're like, oh my God, this guy clearly does not mountain bike. I don't mountain bike. Physically though, I mean, whether we're talking short track, XCO, like it's a very different sport than if Rody hasn't watched any of these races on YouTube, you should go watch it. It's like when you said talk about a wet course, it scares me. I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, I can't believe she just did that. Like, what is it physically and then tactically? Because someone on the road, you know, I, we had a Jason Hillemeyer was on here one time and he said, I can't remember the huge mountain bike rider that came and rode with him on his own, in his own backyard, his own town. And he goes, I realized his level when he was showing me new lines on the trails. I ride week in and week out. He's like, he blew my mind. So I can kind of understand that technical side, but when you talk about physical and then also the technical, like what really jumps out to you that you've been trying to get better at, or just a tip for other riders out there that they might not even be thinking of. I mean, you're, you've forgotten so much about mountain biking that a lot of people haven't even absorbed yet. So what do you kind of think about when you're talking about those aspects of riding? Yeah. Yeah. As far as like the world cup circuit and the, the racing right now, um, I think we're we're kind of seeing a bit of a change, a shift in the courses and the racing because it's just getting a lot faster. Like the speeds are just higher. Uh, we're seeing kind of more like man-made courses, like the one at World Champs this year. Um, Snowshoe was also they made some changes that just kind of make the speed a bit faster. I think it's just more. Um, it's, it's better for viewing purposes, um, for spectators. And so as the racers that changes a bit because, um, the race dynamic kind of shifts from to more like a short track, um, Mm. and maybe like the gaps are smaller, the speeds are just higher. Uh, so that's definitely been like something that I've seen change, but I'm also, um, it's my second, I just finished my second year in the elite category and I feel like I am uh, not playing catch up, but just like I'm building and building and getting closer to where I want to be. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, like, so that's why I feel like um, there's always improvements to be made in my fitness, which is mainly just like getting, building my fitness and my uh, stamina and um, just being able to, to yeah handle the speeds and and not just like a fast race throughout but a good start and then 
you know, sustain that. And then at the same time, uh, play it well mentally and ride your bike well <laughs> and, um, you know, tackle all of the technical aspects of the course and the races. It seems like there's no time for a mistake in a race that's whether it's 30 minutes or 90 minutes. I mean, mistakes are extremely costly in your sport. It's uh road. There's a little bit more leeway at times, but what's, how much do you work on the start in your training? And do you do like standing start or any particular workouts that you do? And is that something that you seem to excel at? Or do you think it's more of a weakness or how do you look at that? Cause it's obviously crucial. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I definitely train that. I, uh, train a lot on my mountain bike and my mountain bike pedals and shoes. Um, I think that's really important. Something that maybe people don't think about, um, but just being used to those, like to clipping in, um, mm -hmm. and so practicing starts, uh, with, you know, one foot on the ground or clipped in just kind of a variety, um, is definitely something that, yeah, I, I do all, all season long. Um, and yeah, I think it's something that I've, I've built, like, um, I've built the power for that, uh, over the years and kind of like by, by just focusing on it a little bit more. Um, but yeah, I mean, the other thing is like, you can be really good at clipping in and starting fast, but when you're on the starting grid in row four or five, um, it's actually not a very fast start. Like you have to, you know, wait a few seconds and then just navigate the chaos. Um, and so it almost becomes more of like, you need to uh, really hone in on reacting to what's around you and like floating through the field and um, finding your pedal smoothly, but you can't, sometimes it's physically not possible to just, you know, move up uh, mm -hmm. super fast. So it's more important to just kind of navigate through that chaos how do you do that so say i'm assuming you would know okay i've got a fourth row start on maybe after the friday night event so you're thinking going into sunday like okay hey this is these are the opportunities to pass possibly or how, you tell me how do you make up those positions because just like you said you can't it's not zwift you can't just ride through everybody <laughs> yeah yeah for sure i mean yeah depending on how short track goes like when um when you're starting third or fourth row um it's definitely an added stress element it's kind of a little bit like more anxiety a little more stress like how it's going to go um oftentimes it sucks but it's a lot about luck um you know like the person in front of you has a good start or if you line mm. up behind like a good starter or a bad starter mm. um that could completely change your uh your start but I think for me, um, I've found that, you know, the, the start is important, but it's not everything. And, um, I've tried, tried kind of had to like, let go of, uh, perfectionism in the start because there's so much you cannot control and more think about like, just staying in my own race. Um, as I said, like just kind of floating through the chaos as best as I can. And then when you get to a place that's wider or maybe after the start loop, then moving up and just, um, yeah, kind of like being calm and, um, and pacing myself through the race has been a lot, a lot more effective than, um, trying to start really, really well. And then maybe getting caught behind stuff, wasting energy, and um yeah going backwards that that's a really good tip when you so when you're i'm thinking of people like you get to race a lot so for athletes that maybe you know maybe they're racing twice a month and the whole aspect i was i can't remember if it was you somewhere it said or somebody else that you know obviously okay good start important but also have to be strong at the end so if you know you have a 90 minute event would you recommend to people like, Hey, have some sessions that are 90 minutes where you're starting hard. You're kind of like simming this, or maybe even you do workouts like this. I don't know if maybe you race enough that you don't need to do something like that. Has that ever been anything you've done before in training or just something that your body gets used to that duration and not crumbling at 
60 minutes, you're like, Oh, okay. My race is over. I have nothing left. Yeah. Um, I, I don't train like, like, uh, frequently, I guess, kind of those simulations, I mm-hmm. guess, um, what's really helpful is, you know, when you can just like do a training race or, um, you know, maybe you have a local weeknight, you know, gathering where everyone just tries to go kill themselves, um, on the bikes and things like that are really helpful just to kind of like, you're doing an effort, you're going all out, but you also have that competitiveness and maybe you even get like a little bit nervous before the start and like, great, you know, that's kind of simulating how you feel before a race. And I always push myself harder when, um, when I'm like training or sprinting or, you know, doing a workout with someone else. Um, so that, yeah, that's a great way to train for sure. Mm, That's a really good point. Do you ever do, do you ever ride in the road? Um, not so much. I mean, not like group, not big group rides. Um, yeah. Training, training, like, you know, long endurance on the roads, but yeah. What type of, when you do a long endurance ride, how long do you go for? Um, typically like between four and five hours. Um, that's kind of my, the max for me. It's, it's definitely not the same as Cole. Um, (laughs) our training is, are so different. Um, and it's been interesting to kind of see the change from when he was training for cross country to now shifting mm. over to endurance. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, just how much more volume they're mm-hmm. doing. Yeah. If you had stayed around and if, I mean, it's better for the mountain bike career, obviously to be on a French based team, but say you were still doing orange shield stuff and still racing mountain bike. Do you think being around other gravel people, you maybe would have, do you have any desire to, I know you did mid South and maybe a few others that I just don't know about, but do you have any interest in gravel or is it you're full on with mountain bike? Yeah, for me, it's full on mountain bike. Um, I, I definitely, I miss the, the scene, the cycling scene in the U S and, um, when I went back and raced little sugar this year and I hung around for big sugar, I was like, yeah, I mean, it's so special The the energy, the vibes are so, so unique and, um, so different than a world cup. Um, everyone is, you know, socializing and talking and friendly and hanging out and, um, at the world cups, everyone is just so focused and serious and, um, yeah, definitely higher stress for me. Um, but yeah, I love the opportunity to race those longer endurance races, but for me for now, um, yeah, it's just full focus on world cups and and the Olympics. So I think, um, I'm, I'm excited that those events are there for maybe sometime in the future. Cool. That's awesome. Has there ever been anything you've done in training that you feel like kind of slowed you down? Not like negative on anything, but you're like, oh, I look back like that really wasn't for me or maybe I wouldn't have gone down that road. Yeah, um, definitely. It's funny, like I think just training, training too hard, Mm. um, being too focused and like I think I can remember so many times in high school where I was, I was super motivated and sometimes to a fault, um, you know, like it's pouring rain outside and I'm like, I have, I have this training on the schedule. I have to go do it. And I would go do it. And, um, yeah, maybe like I'd get sick or I wouldn't get sick, but I'd be like, you know, under so much stress. And I think at such a young age, like it was so unnecessary, but to me, it felt like if I don't do this, you know, I'm going to fall so much far behind and, um, I cannot miss this. Like I can't afford it, but yeah, I think just things like that, um, are just so unnecessary and, um, something I really, I definitely didn't, I didn't see that when I was, when I was younger. Um, and it's, it's, I, it's still really hard for me. Like, you know, when basically it goes back to like listening to your body, it's, it's so challenging as an athlete. Um, and you know, maybe you are exhausted, but you're like, am I being soft? Am I being weak? Or should I really like take a rest day? <laughs> so it's still really a challenge for me. And um, I have good people like Cole to remind me to take a chill pill when I'm in doubt. <laughs> to play a devil's advocate because this, because I still have these conversations with myself, which is sad. Um, but maybe that's what made you so good. 
maybe that's what's driven you to be someone who, when I ask you about graveling, you're like, well, you know, I've got World Cups and, you know, there's this thing called the Olympics and like you're at the highest level, which is insane. It, you know, maybe that obsession, and I don't know, maybe not, but it's just something I always, you know, you're you're crushing so there's got to be a little bit that might be a positive thing too i don't know i see what you're saying but um yeah i think a lot of people lack that. yeah you know i think a lot of people are like yeah. oh it's raining never mind oh it's not yeah, convenient today I, I never don't know. mind honestly if i were to like tell a younger racer um my advice i i still hold true to that like i don't i think it's just unnecessary and when you're young, like I remember in high school, I would be, um, you know, so focused like, oh no, I have a three hour ride on Saturday. Like I can't go hang out or mm. like have a sleepover. Mm. And, um, and it's just things like that. It's like, that's yeah. just, that sucks. Like that's sad. You know, I really wish that I, I, uh, took advantage of more opportunities, like, you know, to try different sports in high school, because, um, I think, yes, it's good. I was really motivated in my sport. Um, but like, it's not going to hold you back. It's not going to like make it so like, no, you can't reach the highest level in what you're doing. Like you can always go back. What other sports would you have gone for? Oh gosh. Um, I was, I was really into soccer when I was, this was when I was like in middle school. Um, I was not good, but I, I really enjoyed it. Um, so I don't know. I, I feel like uh, I always think that, that that's something that like I would have wanted to pursue, but I probably would have been shit at it. Um, <laughs> you never know where it takes you. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, I played soccer. I was not good. And then a volleyball coach, they were, I was tall. I'm tall. So they were hounding me to come play. And I was like, I don't want to play volleyball. Who plays volleyball? And then they were like, it'll be right before basketball. And so you're going to come into basketball, like ready to go. And I was like, sold, let's go. And so, you know, you know, you never know where different sports go, but yeah, that's interesting. I think it is a good point. I think there's a lot to be said too, from what we see, what we take from one sport and bring to another. Um, I always think, uh, I actually think of basketball as I think that's helped me like court awareness. I was Although I'm six five, which is short for a center in high school, it's like on the borderline. But being able to see everything and understanding my positioning, I think has really helped me in road racing of the Peloton of being able to like you kind of have to like zoom back, like the 0.5 zoom on the iPhone now. And I've thought about that because I've talked to other teammates at different points, and it's they're so like there's blinders on. I'm like, dude, you gotta open your like lens because it's more than just like when you smash there's like play the chess game here. So yeah, I'd be curious what you might pick up in soccer that brings you into the XCO world, but for another, for another life to figure that one out. What's um what, when you kind of were talking about talking to younger cyclists or maybe even looking back to yourself again, aside from, you know, kind of went back to your finding the balance. What's any lessons that, you know, you would definitely want to pass on aside from just, Hey, you know, try other things. Don't be too obsessive or maybe a good lesson that you learned. That's another cyclist pass along to you that sticks out to you. Yeah. Um, gosh, I mean, I would say like, um, I think an obvious one is like to like, don't underestimate the power of recovery or resting. Mm -hmm. Like, I think, um, people, I mean, if you're, if you're like training and following a plan or whatever, like, um, the rest is so important. And again, like I said, something I'm still learning. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's, uh, it's so, so crucial and people really underestimated and are, are like pulled because they're, you know, motivated or they see other people doing stuff or they see something on social media that, you know, people, people only post on social media, how hard they're training. They never share like how hard they're resting or, you know, when they're not doing anything. <laughs> I love that. But I don't know who said this, but people always quote it when it's like, are you overtrained or under recovered? And I, you know, I think it's a great, 
line. What's your recovery protocol? Let's say you just are finishing up a big block or maybe even on more micro, like you just smashed a weekend of race. And then on Monday, you're like, woof, I'm feeling that one. What do you, what's your go-to, you know? Yeah. What's your protocol? Yeah. Um, trying to do nothing, uh, which is hard because <laughs> like, yeah, on rest days, it's kind of when you catch up on everything else on emails and, mm. um, you know, meetings or whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, um, just on the day to day, like fueling and kind of trying to just get on top of the fueling, you know, right after your workouts and, um, also on the rest days, like it's a, a really important day to not like cut back, you know? Um, mm. and you know, if I have time, like taking a nap, um, is, is really good, especially when I'm like in race season and, uh, traveling and moving a lot, I find myself a lot more tired and, um, yeah, it, it's really hard because, um, the, the recipe is, is just like trying to clear your schedule and that that's a challenge. That is a challenge. Are you doing recovery rides or are you just focused on getting all the other life things done that day? Uh, sometimes it depends. I, I definitely take like one full day off the bike, um, at least once a week. Um, but then there's other days that are like maybe a more recovery focused ride. Um, I like to just kind of keep the body going and moving, mm -hmm. but sometimes, um, again, it's kind of my like obsessiveness of like wanting to do something all the time. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's really better just to like, you know, today is like, you're not getting on that bike. Yeah, no, that's good. Speaking of life things, something I'm curious that Cole actually, uh, for those that, that don't know, Cole was on the podcast before and you would talk, there's a little blurb on your blog about it just how you started your own squad in 2021 with your partner, Cole, what was that like? And I think this is just, I'd love to hear kind of your take on the way I take it is all of a sudden you guys didn't have a team. He said, Hey, we're going to do our own thing and we're going to go try and find sponsors. And I think I was watching like a lifetime video and Cole made the comment. We got a hundred no's and we just kept going. And can you tell me how, how did you feel through that or how did you take it in is that accurate because I, it's got to be really hard like that's that's tough yeah yeah it was a super tough time um for both of us uh yeah we were without a contract and it was um I think like November early November um of 2020 so COVID had hit everything was on un unknown, you know, for the next year. And, um, we kind of were like, you know, do we continue racing or is this like, uh, do we need to go, you know, find, do something else? Um, but we really like, yeah, I think pushed, both pushed each other. And, um, we were, I was 20. I, I didn't know, uh, yeah. How to reach out to, to sponsors, how to email, um a resume or you know a portfolio we I just started like putting together this portfolio and we decided to do it together um because we felt like it maybe had more value as as a duo um and yeah just kind of just sending it to to anyone and everyone and we got yeah so many no responses um and it was really frustrating because you know you put so much time into it um and we were both just like trying to believe in our each other, like, <laughs> but we were also like, should we be like doing this? Is this dumb? Um, and we were able to put together a, a little program with a uh, huge support from Orange Seal. And um, we, we got ourselves racing the next year. I remember like in January 1st of, uh, our goal was to have, um, both of us have one, built bike by January 1st. Um, cause we were getting like frames from these people and, and parts from over here. And I remember, uh, in the bike shop, like late at night on like around Christmas or in January. Um, yeah, just like trying to help Cole build these bikes. We were like so frustrated, so exhausted from training. And, um, and we we're like, yeah, realizing we, we had to order parts and we were missing stuff. And then to finally like get that bike complete, it was like such a, a good feeling. Um, but yeah, it was a really 
a challenging time and and a big learning experience just kind of throwing ourselves into the business world of mm. uh what it is what it takes to run your own program and um negotiate with partners and um advocate for yourself and then show up and and try to perform what are some tips that you learned from that process yeah i mean i think uh one of the big ones is like um you know, we, we reached out to so many people, got so many no's or, or no replies and just, um, like that's going to happen and, and just to keep, uh, keep believing, I guess. Mm. Um, and then also like just putting yourself out there to people at, it really was a year where, uh, you know, I'm kind of, a um, an introvert, like it's not, it's, I'm not naturally like super, bubbly and and like open and you know talking to everybody um until I get to to know you but um yeah it was definitely like we were just pushing ourselves to like at every event you know go talk to people um just you know introduce yourself like it was it's uncomfortable it's maybe a little awkward but uh I think that 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 became natural um and that was something that's super just a super important um thing to 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 know how to do um and in this in the industry like it's so important and and those personal relationships are so so meaningful um and something that we really valued so the partners that we had we wanted to um yeah have a personal relationship with them and and for them to to know our faces and um and yeah so that was definitely like something that was very uncomfortable but but really important and I think helped us a lot I think it's a skill that will you'll look back on and you'll use it over and over. I mean, I was a sales rep for a really long time and a guy once told me you're either selling or you're being sold to and selling to whoever you're selling to is so nerve wracking. And I hated it at first. And it's like, once I kind of understood the game and how to, it was almost like a start line, like controlling my emotions, especially if there's like a something big on the line and putting yourself out there and then, and, and also knowing your stuff, you know, you have a sponsor that comes back and it's like, well, what's da 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 da. And you've got to know your story and know your blurb and, and don't uh, mm, uh, uh, and get nervous. And so I'm sure you'll look back on that uh, it's at some point and maybe that feels even better now being on a factory team and you can look back like, man, all right, I'm not building my own bike at midnight anymore. So that's got to feel like a big accomplishment. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's been, it's been incredible. And I'm, yeah, for sure. Super grateful for that whole year. Um, in the moment it was like really challenging and, uh, yeah, just really hard to, to keep the confidence of racing and then, and then performing. Um, but yeah, so many skills learned and no better and harder way than to be thrown into it like that. Um, at the same time I was in school full time, um, and studying business. And it was like kind of a, a really interesting, um, parallel that we were, you know, applying in the real world. And I was also in school. Um, so yeah, it gave me so many skills, but yeah, definitely, um, a challenging time, but yeah, I think another, going back to something you said about, um, advice I'd give to younger people yeah. is like the path for me was nowhere near straight, you know, like it was not a straight trajectory. And I would never have uh, believed that of all like the stops that I made on the way to now racing, like on the world cup uh, circuit, I think I, yeah, I jumped from different teams and I had different support and Cole and I made our own program. And, um, there were times when I didn't believe that it could, would be possible and times that I, I did. And, you know, you just, you never know. And, um, it's really hard, but, uh, important to just never, never give up in, in yourself and, and what you believe in. So. I love that. I was listening to a podcast uh, and this woman had said, we want to think that we know what our destiny is, but our only job is to show up. And I, it was like mic drop. I was like, that is powerful because I think we all at some point are, we think what we're going to 
we know what we're going to be doing in three years. And then we go down the road of life. It's like, whoa, this did not see all these things coming. This is a surprise. So yeah, I, something I try to ride the wave. It's uh, yeah, the journey. Let, I'm curious about a couple of things on nutrition. I had heard you talk about pre-race nutrition. You're big on the carbs, at least you used to be. I'm curious if you still are. And you were talking about taking on like 10 grams per kilo of body weight, which is, you know, carb loading in my mind. What, what leads you down that path? Because there's other athletes that will ask me like, Hey, I don't really need to carb load for this crit because it's only 90 minutes or it's 60 minutes. And I'm a big fan of carbs. So I'm curious, what's your thought process in that a lot of carbs, not a super long event. Do you find it beneficial for the race or for recovery after, or what's your plan there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely for both. Um, yeah, for me, like that's a, it's a funny question because carbs are like, that's my fuel. Um, and yeah, it's super important to get your nutrition, um, dialed, but also just more making like sometimes dialed people are like, well, how do I do that? But just making sure you're getting enough, uh, and enough of the right things, which before, uh, for me, my 90 minute races is carb. Um, and I think for, for Cole and in the longer endurance races, it's, it's the same, maybe a little few tweaks, but yeah, for me, um, I, over the years have kind of like, I remember, I think the science has changed too. And I'm not like the best person to ask about the nitty gritty details, but, um, for me, I, I try to shoot for, yeah, that, um, 10 grams per kilogram of body weight in carbs. And I do that, uh, the day before my events. So I maybe kind of, um, cut back a little bit on the fat just so I, um, feel I can get in that, that amount of carbs. Um, and it's, it's really important, especially for these double header weekends where we're racing short track on Friday night. Uh, we finish racing at seven 30, seven, seven 30, um, we have to sleep <laughs> after we've, um, raced for 30 minutes and, you know, we're capped up and, um, adrenaline is pumping. So, and then the next day is like full recovery, prepare for XC. Um, and that's when like, I'll be carb loading and everything. And then yeah, race for the 90 minute event. So yeah, carbs, super important. And, um, it's never like, I love I love food. I love eating. So it's never, um, never like really a challenge for me. Um, but definitely finding like the, maybe the right, um, the right foods to eat. Like I keep it pretty, pretty simple, like rice, simple pastas, um, and like just pretty clean carbs. Mm. And I liked how you said dialed like it's not always going to be the exact same because as you're talking about traveling before you might be in spain you might be in france you might be here they're not always going to have all the same thing so you just keep it simple and then just take on whatever carbs you get your hands on like you can't be too tied to some magical pre-race meal i'd assume yeah i mean i try to um over the years being more in europe i've definitely like at first i was like my first time in Europe, I'm like, where, like, where do I, all this food is different. Like the brands are different and everything. And so it was really hard to find the same things like, you know, you would be mm -hmm. used to. And now I feel like I've navigated the supermarkets and, and the stores well enough to like, yeah, everything that is here, I can find there. Um, but definitely like for me, rice and chicken or rice and eggs is a pretty standard pre- race night meal. Um, and it's nice cause I can find that anywhere. Um, you know, everywhere has rice, eggs, so that can always kind of be the same. Cool. Thinking about off the bike stuff, uh, do you run at all or do any strength training or what else are you doing besides riding? Yeah. Um, I definitely do like mobility kind of activation mm -hmm. strength. Um, more dynamic stuff, not so much like heavy squats and stuff in the gym, but just keeping like a good mobility and activation routine uh, year round. 
And then riding my mountain bike, um, for Mm. me is like the best strength training I think I could be doing. Um, and, and then supplemented with like some, some, some more dynamic, like activation stuff, but yeah, just kind of, um, keeping those muscles, like moving and working throughout the year, um, and not like hanging up my mountain bike for months during the off season, um, mm-hmm. really helps me. And it keeps my skills, um, pretty like honed too. Do you do any like low cadence, high torque type work or literally just go ride the trails or anything like specific on the bike that you feel like is good for strength? Yeah, definitely. Um, I do like some, you know, more high torque efforts. I mean, a bit of everything, but as far as like overall strength, I think for me, it's really um, helpful when my upper body feels strong because these courses and mountain biking in general is so physical. Um, so yeah, like having at least a couple of days a week where I'm riding like challenging trails where, um, it's super technical. And then also when I can like, um, you know, working it out with like my, my interval session to maybe do like a, a really challenging descent after my interval set or, um, or, as part of it, you know, just to kind of simulate like, um, a race course as much as I can. I like that. What's, what do you, you would, uh, I, you should bring the blog back. That's my one tip. I've like enjoyed reading the 2021, the tw- there's some, you actually can find, I think it's your old blog. I don't even know if I like a Weebly one. That's like way back. I think maybe into Nike days or like 2018. Oh yeah. Way back. Yeah. I was doing some Googling. But you had talked about passion to inspire other people to discover the bike as a lifelong sport and really feel empowered on the bike. So you would talk kind of when you and Cole were trying to figure out what the next move is. Hey, is this crazy? Should we stop doing this? Say mountain biking ends tomorrow. You can't race. How do you think the bike stays in your life? Or maybe another endurance sport. It's not soccer, but you know, what do you think is a lifelong athlete? where do you think that'll take you? You obviously can't predict the future, but you know, if it was like not competitive, you're, you know, the national champion days are in the past. Where do you see that going? Yeah. I mean, I think I will always be active and like into something, some kind of sport. Um, I see the bike as always being part of my life. I mean, I feel like I have a, a really healthy relationship with it in that, um, yeah, I, like I don't really get burnt out on riding the bike. Um, and I love that it can either be a really intense training tool or device, and it can also just be like a way to commute, you know, or to to get from one place to the other, or just to go out and feel the, the breeze on your face and, and get some exercise. So um, I think it'll always be in my life, but I think, yeah, if there was more time opened up, I would, um, I'd get into maybe running or, or hiking or, um, yeah, just, I don't know, some other, some other kind of way movement. Um, I definitely have a lot of interests, um, outside of the bike. I grew up sailing and, uh, Cole introduced me to skiing when I went to college in Colorado with him. Um, definitely something that I would like to master sometime in my future, but now I'm not definitely not mastering it quite yet. Um, so yeah, there's, there's so many things. Nordic or downhill skiing? Uh, he taught me to actually do both. Um, I really want to learn how to backcountry ski. Okay. Um, but I think I need to just get more comfortable on the skis first. Yeah, I grew up in California and right. there we didn't go to the snow. Um, it, it wasn't close. So yeah, it was very, very foreign when I got on the skis for the first time. Uh, so I was surrounded by snow. So people were like, you need to stop riding your bike when it's 20 degrees out. You need to get into Nordic skiing. And so I did some skate skiing. So hard, so challenging. Uh, shout out to Marty and Jason who tried to teach me the, it's like swimming, right? You can't like fight the snow. So they're giving me the technique tips, which were massive, but you can only get 
you know, I was still cat five when uh, the first winter was over and I was like, ah, this, you know, this is cool, but I don't like driving an hour to go here. And da, da, da. so, yeah, I came up with a bunch of excuses and rode the trainer. But um, I have two quick questions last with respect to your time that are from mountain bikers that heard I was podcasting with you and they're like, oh, my God, dude, you have to ask her these questions. I said, OK, I'm going to ask her at the end because I don't want to mess up the vibe of the interview. She's like, this guy doesn't mountain bike. Why is he asking me this? Okay, how do you dial in tire pressure? Do you use something like the cork device that shows you exact tire pressure on your phone? Or do you do hot laps? And how does this change between the Friday night race and then the Sunday race? And let's say conditions are going to be the same. Okay, yeah, good question. Um, Yeah, tire pressure is really important to me. I have kind of um figured out what the kind of range of pressure that I like over the years and um it's what I I keep for 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 training and then it's tweaked if a little bit for the races but usually just by like a PSI or two um mm-hmm. and I feel like I am always kind of on the conservative side if it's really rocky or super dry conditions and you know there's a lot of flat um risk I will always like keep it a little higher or at least in the rear um mm-hmm. just to avoid avoid that um I also run an insert most of the time in the rear um which for me is just yeah it allows me to run a little bit lower pressure so I have more grip but um reduces the risk of like a pinch flat or something like that um and in the last year I have invested in a tire pressure gauge which uh for me is really important because then I can just check my pressure before every ride with the same tire pressure gauge. Uh, so I have the confidence that like, I know it's, it's what I set it at. Um, Mm. I've had so many rides where I get out there and I'm like feeling kind of sketchy, kind of slipping around. And I'm like, I feel like my tires are, are too hard, you know? So just Mm. like that ease of mind. Um, and just like knowing that, that you, have the right pressure in there. Are you talking about one of those little digital gauges that you just pop on there? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just a little, I've never used the the phone. Um, like, I don't even know how that works. It's way too high tech for me. <laughs> so, this is funny that you bring it up. I was at master's nationals and I was like, man, I don't know. It's not like the bike just feels, it must be the heat. I realized the gauge broke and I was like 10 PSI off. And I was like, this just doesn't seem right. And I then was next to this guy. I'm like, Hey man, can I double check with your pump? He's like, well, hold on, let me show you this thing. I'm going to test this. He's like, oh dude, yours is way off. He's like, did you use this yesterday? I'm like, yeah, I yes, I did. So I bought a Topeak one and well, uh, someone's going to want me to ask what tire inserts are you using? Um, They're called, it's like a, it's a European brand. They're Adriani Supermus. Okay. I think is cool. the name. Yeah. I think it's like a French brand and I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it, but parlez-vous français? Mm, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, last question. Um, and just to clarify for the other roadies out there, in these events, you pick hardtail or full suspension. Correct me if I'm wrong. You have to use the same bike on Friday and Sunday. Do you ever ride hardtail, or is it always full suspension? And how do you choose between the two if you do? Yeah, uh, this year we've only had a full suspension and, um, last year I, I had a hardtail, but I raced the majority on the full suspension and Mm -hmm. I feel like the, the weight is so the, the weight difference is so minimal. Um, Mm -hmm. at least like it depends what bike brand you're on, but, um, for us it's super, super small. So for me, like it's a no, I don't know. I, I, I think that the full suspension, like I'm so, so content racing it, um, on, on like pretty much all of the courses these days. Um, and even if it's a pretty smooth course, but there's like a bunch of braking bumps or, um, you know, I think that you can just recover so much better with the full suspension on the downhills that, um, and the weight difference isn't that much that for me, it's worth, uh, not having to like, switch bikes um on and off throughout the year and your body has to get used to a whole new like geometry and everything so taking that out has really kind of 
um, made it a lot easier. I feel like on my body throughout, throughout a long season. Are we talking like two pounds difference or five pounds or what's the, do you know off the top of your head? Like how close? I don't know off days? the top of my head. Um, I, I'd say it's more around like two pounds, but okay. it just, it does depend on the, the bike brand. brand. Sure. Sevilia, thank you so much for doing this. Um, any final comments for the people? You've already given a ton of advice. So usually I'm like, hey, drop drop another gem on people, but you've already littered, littered us with those and really appreciate your candor and just kind of opening up about not only your process, but just, you know, going through the hard times and the successes and congrats on all the success, which is, I should say at the start. Any parting words for all the people that will be listening to you? Yeah, no, thanks for having me. And um yeah, shout out Cole for connecting us. Yes, and Cole. It thank was great you. to. Oh, okay, so I felt terrible because Cole, you know, I hit him up, and I don't personally know Cole, and he was so gracious to come on. And then there were quite a a few people that were saying, "Hey, Cole was awesome. Can you get his girlfriend on?" And I was like, "I don't know Sevilla either." So I'm actually gonna have to email Cole. Hey, uh, I'm gonna like IG. Sevilla and it might not go can you like check if she wants to do a podcast I felt so bad she's so gracious she's like oh dude yeah let, he goes I'll give a nudge and we'll see where it goes and so thank you for reaching out there were um a, a lot of people that are super excited to hear from you so we're really great thankful that you're so gracious with your time and uh yeah this is great really appreciate it everybody oh the the best place maybe she'll get back to blogging you guys can google the blog Instagram is that the place, best place for people to keep up with you or any other like social media type things that you're into TikTok or Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, no, Instagram is the best place. Um, it's the most up to date and yeah, I'm actually, I am working on my, my website again. So hopefully some Let's more go. stuff will be up there, but, um, yeah, stay tuned. Awesome. Everybody check it out. And thank you so much for your time. Everybody go give her a follow on IG. Watch for the new posts on the blog and we'll talk to you all soon.